Okay, so this month we're going to talk about uh, VC package, and it is a package manager that is uh, written in C++ by Microsoft. We can go over and look at their GitHub page. So it's just Microsoft VC package. Let me make this a little bigger. And um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take a look at what it's like to download this and install it. So first thing you have to do is um, they don't make a binary distribution of VC package itself available. It's uh, open source. You're just expected to uh, build it from source. It could be packaged into like, you know, a Debian package and distributed in some Linux distribution, of course. So we're going to clone it. And it is github.com, Microsoft VC package .git, And we will clone that here. Let's take this and do the same thing over on the Linux side. Okay, so once we've cloned that, we have their source directory and there is a bootstrap file script for one for Windows and one for Linux. And it's going through and it's building the VC package binary. And as soon as that's finished, we'll have an executable and we can run that executable and it has a command line interface with some commands. So getting VC package onto your machine is not difficult at all. Over here, it's downloading CMake to build itself on, on Linux, but it's going to end up with the same result, an executable that we can run and we can give it commands to manipulate packages. Now there, initial philosophy on packages was we will download the source and then we will build the appropriate configuration for what you've requested. And then your build runs and links against compiled libraries and includes installed headers for those packages that you've downloaded and installed. And what they've added more recently, let's go back over here. Uh, it's this one. So this is a blog post from their developer blog from September 14th. So this is just a couple months ago that they started uh, supporting binary caching of build results. Cause you can imagine if you had, uh, let's just take something that has a really heavy build time, like the QT framework. So if you have a QT GUI application and you're trying to do continuous integration builds and do some testing against those builds, you want, a short turnaround time for that so that it, when you get the automated notification that you broke a test, it's shortly after you caused the problem, not like a day later. So QT just takes a really long time to build. So you don't typically build it as part of your continuous integration step. You have a pre-built binary and you want a package manager that supports that idea. So that they now have binary caching support and the, what they mean by this is they have repositories. Well, repository is probably the wrong way to specify it. They have, um, storage sources, binary source locations that are specified. It can be either a local directory or it can be a remote directory. It can be a new get uh, package provider. Um, and, uh, I think they even have a way of using those uh, artifact repository servers that are used in Java build environments a lot. Um, but at any rate, there's a way for you to build the binary in a certain configuration. So obviously you're not going to share an arm binary with an x86 machine, but depending on the configuration that you've built it for, if you have another machine that's running a compatible configuration, then they can get the binaries from the other machine or from 
a local cache on that particular machine and uh, use those instead of having to rebuild everything. So that's good for continuous integration. And uh, this manifest uh, thing that they have in this other in this blog post, those are the two big features: is binary caching and manifests. And we'll see how a manifest look uh, in a second. So over here, that's great. Now we have a, a we easily got this tool for interacting with their package system. So um, if we look in here, let me make this a little smaller because the little toolbar is hiding it from me. Um, search sounds like a good thing. We want to search for a package. So what I have here is I did not write this myself. I copied this from like the, basically the, uh, boost spirit, hello world example. This is a little example of using boost spirit. I was talking about it before we started recording that. Boost Spirit is a parsing library that allows you to generate a parsing grammar by just writing what looks like C++ expressions. It turns into template meta expressions that go into the library and results in producing a parser for the rules of your grammar. This particular parser example uh, parses a line containing comma separated digits with intervening white space. And it tells you if the input that you gave it parsed successfully or not. So it's just a little example of using a boost library. Now, the reason I picked boost spirit as an example is because boost spirit is one of those libraries that sits on shoulders that all sit on shoulders that sit on shoulders in the sense that the transitive dependencies of include throughout the entire boost uh, structure results in quite a lot of libraries that you didn't realize were being used being slurped in. So you either have to take all of boost, in which case you're guaranteed to have it all, or if you want to get the minimal subset, it's hard to know how to pare that down. So this is a good example. It's a header only library, however, so there's no building uh, of any code needed to consume the library. My other example here that we're going to look at is a SQLite three example. And, and again, this is just kind of their basic hello world kind of SQLite three program. It's actually C code that um, you give it a database and a SQL statement and it executes a SQL statement against the database and returns the results. So um, with SQLite three, this would be a library that has to be compiled into a binary, unlike the header only library example we looked at. So I've got these two examples and Inside here, if I search for boost, you can see that they have a package for it's 1.74, 1.75 just came out. So this is pretty up to date. Um, they have a single package that's everything in boost. And then they have individual packages for the individual libraries within boost. And they've tracked the dependencies between different libraries and boost. So if you ask for any of any one of these other libraries, you get all the transitive dependencies as well. And as always with these things, when you're about to make some kind of big change to your, uh, your environment, it's always good to know if there's a way that we can kind of do a test run just to see what is going on. And you see that, um, this is the basic help. And if you want help on more specific commands, we can do VC package help install. And we see that install has an option called dry run. So we can do a dry run of installing a package on our machine without making any changes to our machine. So let's take a look at that. If we say VC package install dry run boost spirit, we see that, wow, yeah, it's really going to pull in a whole ton of these other libraries from Boost, which again, sometimes these libraries are just a single header file with some convenient stuff in it. Like Boost for each, I don't think is more than a single header file that gives you a kind of a range-based four before range-based fours were available in the syntax. And quite 
a bunch of additional packages will be installed just because we asked for Boost Spirit. So they've done a good job of trying to track the dependencies between packages, so it's hard for you to get a package without its dependencies, which is good to know. Now, um, I mentioned the, the, uh, their little blog post had talked about, let's shorten this window up to a little bit. Okay. Their blog post had talked about manifest files. And if you've ever used package managers and other languages, um, you're probably familiar with the idea of a manifest file. So source directory. This vcpackage.json that I wrote says that this code that we're building here has a dependency on the SQLite 3 package. And in the spirit one, I say that I depend on boost spirit. Now, the interesting thing about VC package for uh, CMake users is the way that they've glued in the package management into the CMake process. So CMake uh, for cross compiling purposes has the concept of a tool chain file where you specify the locations of your compiler and your assembler and your linker and so on. The set of um, executables that make up the tool chain for cross compiling to a particular target. And what VC package has done is glued itself into CMake's machinery by presenting itself as a tool chain. And in the VC package directory that you get from cloning from GitHub, they have a scripts folder and inside scripts is a build systems folder. And inside there is a VC package .cmake. And this is the thing that they're using to glue themselves into the CMake machinery so that when you build, if you don't have the appropriate dependency packages, that VC package will go and install them locally, which means that um, depending on, let's go back up here on the install command, there was a command line argument that specifies a set of sources for binary caching. And if we look at their help for binary caching, we see that the sources are specified as strings. Um, there's a way to specify a directory. There's a way to specify a NuGet uh, package manager and clear removes all the previous sources. So it lets you from the command line override anything that might be coming in from, um, the environment because a lot of these command line arguments in VC package, they have a fallback environment variable that you can set to get a single global default. So with that package file in there, let's try the spirit one. Sorry, with this manifest file, um, if I configure my CMake with the tool chain coming from VC package. The tool chain looks in here, sees this JSON file, and then does an installation of all the dependencies before it attempts to build anything. It, it does the installation of the dependencies at, at CMake configure time. So let's try that. Um, I've got a little batch file I wrote that just specifies the value of this tool chain file on the command line, along with whatever other command line arguments that I passed in so that I don't have to keep typing this. Um, you can similarly, if you're using CMake GUI, if you're using a shortcut to launch the GUI, you can add the extra command line arguments to the shortcut um, so that you have one that automatically is configured for VC package. And what I'm going to do here is go to my boost example. I've got a source directory. I'll make a build directory and I will say VC package CMake dot dot source. And what did I do wrong? Oh, 
Yes. Okay. Sorry. I moved it. I renamed it. <laughs> I renamed it from source to VC package. Let's try this again. Okay. So running VC package install, it's reading my dependencies out of that JSON file and downloading them all. And there's no build for this header only library. So I don't think it, uh, it, it builds anything. It's silent. So I, I mean, without looking at what processes are running, I can't say exactly what it's doing, but it is going and downloading the source package for boost spirit and all its corresponding dependencies and installing them into my build directory. So there's different ways that you can integrate VC package packages that have been installed into your build. The way I'm doing it with the manifest file, it puts all the downloaded uh, files into your build directory. So if you delete your build directory, it's going to, um, why well, technically what I said just isn't true. It caches the downloads into a, a machine wide location. And then the, the downloads are unpacked and, uh, an install image structure. So an include folder and a library folder containing libraries that you can link against that is what is created in your build folder. So if you nuke your build folder and do this again, it's not going to download the packages again. It's just going to copy them and uh, build whatever needs to be built. The other mechanism that you can use to integrate the packages into your build is you can install the packages globally, meaning the built binary images are in a global location. And then you can request that VC package integrate itself with visual studio. And that can be done either on a per project or a per user basis. And really what that's doing is, is it's going and adding the necessary include and library search directories into the visual studio settings. And it's either doing it in such a way that it is in the default settings or it's in the settings for a particular project. Um, I kind of like this manifest file mechanism better because I don't like my build system uh, functioning by indirect mechanisms. And what I mean by that is the manifest JSON file comes when I clone the repository of my source code. So the dependencies are explicit and the integration is explicit rather than, um, happening by indirect settings through my IDE or through environment variables. So while this is running on the windows machine, we can go over here and go to the SQL light one and get this one building over here. And let's just do it this way for yucks. It's a CMake tool chain file. Let's just make sure I got this right. Home. VC package. Scripts build systems. VC package CMake. All right, let's get this. Okay, so we're in the build. And unfortunately for me, on my Linux machine, the CMake here, I don't have the uh, authority to upgrade it. But it's 3.5 and it doesn't include the find module for SQLite 3. Yeah foiled. Let's try a 
let's try the boost one. This machine is remote, so I'm not using the same network. Okay, so this one finished first. If we do a make in here, it's going to compile our example. And if we run it, that worked. This has now got past the install part and it finished as well. Well, it finished generating. I haven't done a build yet here. I can do that. And that should give us a, re a release directory with an executable in it. So pretty simple. The uh, SQLite one will work on this machine. So let's try that because that will give us an example of compiling a library that we're going to consume. So the things we want in a package manager, we want to be able to work identically across platforms. I would say that VC package uh, achieves that. The bootstrapping was the same. The command lines are obviously the same. Uh, the workflow is the same. The details of where locally cached uh, download tarballs and uh, locally cached binaries are different, of course, because uh, just, you know, the conventions of two operating systems are such that they're not going to be stored in the same place. Um, in Windows, that ends up being local app data VC package. That's where it caches the downloaded um, source packages or uh, whatever, whatever it downloaded gets cached there. If I were to install a package globally on the machine, I believe the um, install location for those packages would be similar to that. Um, what, what I did with the manifest file has BC package install has um, directories in my build tree. And if we just take a look in here, we can see an x64 windows lib is SQLite 3.lib. That's the uh, library we need to link against. And this particular distribution, uh, uh, this packaging rather of SQLite packages it as a DLL so that DLL is in the bin directory. And if we go over here and we don't have a build yet, so let's build. So now I have the SQLite example and you notice that it also copied the dependent DLLs from our dependent packages into our binary folder. So that is a, uh, a convenience all by itself. Uh, usually I've had to do things like in CMake put custom build commands to run post link to copy the dependent DLLs over, but VC package took care of that for us. So that was nice. That was a little pleasant surprise there. Um, if we run this, oops, if we run the example, oh, I need to give it like a database and, you know, this is going to fail because I don't have any such table text, but it now created that SQLite empty file. So it, it did run and, um, it gave us our dependent DLLs. So that was nice in the VC package installed folder, we have whatever binaries we need, like the DLLs. We have the header files in the include and the link libraries in lib. In the include, we just have SQLite because that's the only dependency or the only package that we installed with VC package. Whereas if we go look over here at at the boost one.
evidence. Deep directory structure. Let's try it this way. Yeah, there a ton of files got installed because we want to boost spirit and it transitively depended on all kinds of other things in boost. So it took care of all of that for us. That's a good thing. Um, there is this X64 windows here and I, I haven't mentioned this yet. So let's talk about it now. Um, VC package differentiates the built packages according to what it calls a triplet. So if we um, take a look at their help for that. Um, it has, it really triplets just map to a file in the VC package distribution that tells it how to build things. So usually it's a combination of target CPU architecture, operating system, and you may optionally have things on there like whether or not you want to statically, statically link against the libraries or whether you're willing to dynamically link against them. My general recommendation is either do everything dynamically or do everything statically. It, it can be a mess if you try to mix and match. Um, and you can see they have these built-in triplets. They have uh, ARM Universal Windows Platform, ARM 64 Windows. So this would be like an ARM tablet running Windows. Uh, X64 Linux, X64 OS X, so for targeting Mac OS. X64 Universal Windows Platform, Windows Static 64-bit, plain Windows 64-bit. I, I would infer that this means uh, dynamic linking and 32-bit windows, right, x86 instead of x64. And then they have these so-called community triplets. So the, the built-in triplets are ones that they test regularly and uh, have confidence in. The community triplets have been contributed by the community and they haven't been as, as strictly vetted or curated. But to see what they are, if we just look in the triplets folder, you can see, for instance, here's x86 windows.cmake. All it does is set a couple CMake environment, or, or sorry, set a couple CMake variables that control uh, the CMake, basically the CMake configuration to target that triplet. So the target architecture is x86, not x64, because this is the 32 bit windows. And the CRT linkage is dynamic, and the VC package. Uh, library linking is dynamic. So this is telling VC package for any libraries that you download and build, build them as dynamic libraries if they can be built that way. Um, there. So let's see, we went over, it's easy to find packages, use their search command. Unfortunately, the downside of that is Suppose you don't know what they called the package and then you want to kind of look through to see what everything's available, you know, but there's, you know, too many to scroll through really. So it's kind of, I can only supply a fixed piece of text. I can't supply um, any kind of, you know, regex or globbing pattern. So... If I don't know the right text to search for, it's going to be hard to find. And the repository of known packages is in their ports folder. Basically, they have a directory per package. And, okay, that means if I clone the repository, I get the current state of affairs of the known packages. And if they add packages, then I have to update my clone and rebuild what well, I might not need to rebuild it because it could just be consulting the files on disk. But presumably if you update the repository, there's going to be changes to the code as well as to this packages folder. So you'd, you'd rebuild it. Um, 
it doesn't emit a version, so it's hard to track without tracking the git hash how you would control um, changes to VC package itself into your reproducible build. Now, one there are different ways that they show how to integrate VC package into your workflow, and one mechanism that they uh, discuss is using VC package as a sub module of your project's Git repository. And if you do that, then you're controlling VC package at an individual hash level because your sub modules file is going to say use the VC package repository at this particular hash. So that would give you reproducible builds. Um, but it's interesting that they've chosen that for now, their mechanism of making packages available is to commit the files into their repository and push that out to everybody by a git update, right? So that is in contrast to something like node package manager, which uses a remote website as basically a database backend to probe packages that are available and um, get package descriptions remotely. I expect that you know, having some kind of catalog server is on their roadmap. It's just not what they've done yet, what they've implemented yet. Um, but that is something to consider. Um, there is this binary source option to install. And if you, uh, there's also, so there's this VC package binary sources environment variable that can be used if you don't want to use the command line argument or you have some other reason why it's easier to use the environment variable, like setting it once and not having to have it appear on every build command. So they've kind of um, got a way for you to get packages from uh, that are built from other locations, but if you have your own packages that you want to add, you basically have to add them into their little packages folder, add a directory in there and you know, a mechanism to describe the build. Um, now one package that if you've ever tried to build it yourself, you know how difficult it is, is open SSL. That is a package that's commonly used for any kind of network oriented application in order to have, um, you know, access to cryptography and so on. So if you've ever tried to build that yourself, you know how painful it is. I think if I remember, there's like a Perl script that has to be run and build time and all kinds of other things that are uh, difficult to get going. It's not just like getting a CMake oriented build. You do a CMake configure and then you, you generate and then you run, run the build. It's not that simple. So they do have a... an open SSL package and it's one, one H. So that's up to date. And that is very handy just by itself. Like if I never needed to build SSL on windows again, that would just save me so much grief. If I had to build it on a regular basis that using this package manager just for that would be nice. So when they port packages into their mechanism, the, it goes smoother if the package is CMake based, but clearly they can adapt a wide variety of build requirements and, and get things going. Um, so it's easy to find packages, even though they are describing packages purely by the, the files that you get by cloning their repo. Um, it's easy to consume packages. One nice thing about my little example over here uh, let's take a look at it. Oh, source. If we look at my CMake script here, um, the only thing I do is a find package on boost to get the include ders that I need from my header only library. There's, you notice there's nothing in my CMake uh, build description that says anything about VC package. It's not including any VC package macros. It's not, so I didn't have to modify my build at all. This is the standard kind of CMake uh, build description I would have 
whether I used VC package or not. So by integrating through the toolchain file, they've made it easy to use without requiring you to change anything in your CMake build scripts. And I haven't tried it with um, a non CMake oriented build. They also, they also support seamlessly integrating into an MS build based build on windows um, on Linux with some kind of bespoke make oriented build. I imagine it's just going to be that you have a build script that before it invokes make, it's going to invoke VC package. So I don't anticipate that uh, you would have to modify any of your make files. You, you just maybe have a, a, another script that needs to be edited to do the VC package step, which is to be expected, right? You got to get these dependencies from somewhere. So you already probably already have some kind of script to orchestrate those dependencies already. Uh, especially in a CI build, because you're not going to want to be rebuilding everything from scratch. Um, so pretty easy to consume. I didn't have to change my build script very much, or sorry, or at all. I had to change how I invoke CMake, but I didn't have to change any of my CMake lists. Um, now, they have a mechanism for... Um, local packages that you can kind of, as I described by, you can just edit that packages directory and then VC package will know about your package. It's not ideal. And on their roadmap is improved uh, support for local private packages. Um, probably something that would package up like a binary library. Perhaps you're consuming third party binary libraries for which you don't have source. So obviously you can't build them, um, but packaging those up and, uh, making them available to your binary sources. Uh, that is on their roadmap. And um, I do think they need to, and it's going to happen at some point just through growing pains, they, they're going to need to move to some kind of um, network-based catalog of packages. It's also not ideal Got to be in the right directory. It's also not ideal in that, you know, it just kind of lists out this one line description of the library. Um, it would be nice if there were more metadata like the website of, you know, where the library distribution lives or something like that or documentation for it. Because if I don't already know what one of these libraries does, uh, I kind of have to go outside of the universe of VC package and do a Google search and find it and figure out if it's the right library for me. It'd be nicer if I could do that from within VC package itself. I think that's just a growing pain that they're going to overcome at some point, but they're not quite there yet. Um, it, the other requirement that I had for something I want in a package manager is that this package manager doesn't require any other language. I don't have to have Python installed. Um, and if I have the wrong version of Python installed, it's not a problem because it's not using Python. It's not using Perl. It's not using even CMake. It's, it doesn't even assume that. Um, it integrates well with CMake, but it in no way requires uh, CMake uh, for you to consume it. Um, if it downloads a source package that uses CMake to build, to build, it will go and get CMake as well. Um, and similarly for like that open SSL package that requires a Perl script to be run, it will go and get a uh, Perl and bootstrap Perl onto the machine if necessary in order to get through that. So, um, I found it to be a good experience. I had tried... Uh, Conan in the past, I never gave a presentation on it. Um, I was trying to use Conan just to get some packages for another purpose. And, uh, it, I didn't find it worked very well on windows and, um, seemed to have confusion about how you create debug binaries and how you create lease binaries on windows in order to, you know, link without warnings and things like that. 
But um, that was some time ago. It's, I'm sure it's gotten better since then, but I haven't gone back to it. I, I'm not really a fan of package managers that are written in other languages or expect me to write little configuration blobs in other languages, not because I'm a language bigot, but because I just think it's simpler for a C++ developer if I don't need anything more than a C or C++ compiler the way CMake is oriented. Um, but, the, you know, I recognize that's just a piece of opinion and other people have different opinions and that's fine. But that's just my preference on things. So overall, I thought VC package was a uh, it's it's a good offering, and it worked well for my Windows scenarios that I know are difficult. Uh, we didn't look at it in the debugger, but in my in my example boost uh, spirit uh, parser example. I stepped through that in the debugger and had no problem stepping into all the header files that correspond to the implementation of the parser framework. And for SQLite, I had no problem stepping into these functions that call into the library and stepping into the source code for SQLite. So um, and that was with a, uh, let's just double check here. We see package installed. We got X64 windows and we have a debug library as well as a release library. So there's the debug import library and the debug DLL. So in a debug configuration in Visual Studio, if I needed to, I could step into SQLite and step through that. Sometimes your problems don't manifest themselves exactly until you're able to step into the thing you're using and realize you've been using it wrong. Uh, you know, code's crashing because you passed a bad arguments and you, it was hard to debug that without a debug version of the dependency. But that's possible with VC package because it's building everything. Now, um, you notice I have a, sorry, in this X64 Windows, I had a debug directory, but not a release directory. If I go back up here and do a build. Uh, oh, I know. Sorry. I had them both, but I misspoke. The, they segregated the debug ones. And they put the release ones in the non-segregated area. So it built, um, when it installed the package, it built the debug and the release and installed both of them. Um, they must map, uh, by default, CMake generates other uh, build configurations as well. In Visual Studio, it generates like a min size rel and a... Um, release with debug information configuration. And I'm guessing that for both of those, they're mapping them to the corresponding release or debug dependency. I didn't drill into the details on that. But overall, I thought the experience was good. Um, it, uh, it, despite the weakness of my environment over here on my Linux machine, this is a, a shared Linux machine at my office. And uh, unfortunately, my CMake is too old and uh, it wouldn't cooperate on locating SQLite. But it did okay with um, building SQLite. So if we take a look here. Oh, no, it didn't. Y yes, it did get that far. Okay, because it does the VC package stuff first. So example SQLite, we should have a VC package installed and an X64 Linux. And then here's the SQLite library and the debug SQLite library. So it didn't have problem building SQLite, 
but my CMake is too old that I didn't have the find module for SQLite, so it, it, it couldn't locate these pre-built, well, it couldn't locate these versions that were built by VC package. If I had been using binary caching, they could have been pre-built, but it turns out that I was building them locally. So uh, overall, I, get, I give this good marks for a package manager. It does the things that I want out of it. It's usable now. And based on their uh, roadmap of where they're going, um, the two things that they've publicly announced on their roadmap are private repositories of packages so you can package up um, you know, proprietary libraries that are part of your build in a, in a you know, production environment. Maybe you're consuming third-party binary components or you have your own third-party or you have your own binary components that are made by other teams or whatnot. Um, setting that up to consume that. Um, you could do it now with some directory sharing. Um, but I think they want to improve that experience a little bit. And then the other thing that they want to improve is... If we look at these manifest files, I specified the dependency that I was going to use, but I, they currently don't support locking that dependency to a specific version. So I get whatever version of SQLite happens to be associated with that name. So VC package search SQL light three. It happens to be 3.33.0, but I can't specify that myself. So that's on their uh, roadmap as coming up soon as well. That's specifying a particular version of a dependency. If you're familiar with, again, node, node package manager, uh, you can specify the particular version of the dependency that you're using so that as that dependency evolves, you don't move forward on that dependency unless you explicitly update your dependency because that, that, you know, that it's a network. It's not just a, a tree with respect to each individual library. So upgrading one may necessitate upgrading others. So you want to do that in a controlled manner. Um, that's the one philosophy, you know, there's the kind of the Google philosophy of always build it top of tree. It's not a cut and dry case, which is better. Um, I think Google's in the situation where the amount of resources they can throw at things is such that they can always afford, they can afford to build from top of tree all the time and keep everything moving in a way that's not disruptive. I think for smaller organizations, that's a challenge. Um, and just keeping on top of things can be a challenge all by itself. Uh, so overall, I thought this was a good experience. And one of the interesting things that they have support for in open source projects is, and this is a relatively new feature to GitHub. I wasn't aware of it until I read up on VC packages support for it. Um, but on GitHub, you can now add packages so binary blobs of stuff that you're going to consume in your build you can put those on github and they can be configured as nuget packages or i guess uploaded as nuget nuget packages so if you're not familiar nuget n u g e t like nugget nuget is a package manager for the .net community or dot, you know, dot .NET framework, dot .NET development, etc. It's integrated into Visual Studio. Uh, it's also been open sourced, I believe. And VC Package has the support to use NuGet packages as one of the binary sources. So the interesting workflow for an open source uh, project is build my dependencies create new get packages of those dependencies, put those new get packages on GitHub and then configure VC package to consume the dependencies pre-built from GitHub. And that way my continuous integration build doesn't have to rebuild the dependencies. 
And that's an interesting scenario, but I haven't uh, investigated all the details on that. I think that's enough meat that it could be its own presentation. It might be what I do next month. Um, enabling that whole continuous integration workflow through GitHub Actions and uh, having the continuous integration consume packages from the GitHub packages mechanism and have it all tied together with VC package. I think that would be an interesting um, case study and seeing how well all this stuff works for an open source project. I, I guess for uh, a private project, you could, if you uh, set up your own NuGet server, then you can serve the binary packages to your internal CI builds from that new get server. If you're not already doing that, I don't know if there's any significant benefit to making a new get package versus just a zip file of the distribution, uh, which is what happens now. Uh, so VC package has a, an export command. And that al allows you to get a zip file for a particular package uh, for a particular package that has been built. So the zip file contains the built binaries, and that zip file can be uh, consumed through one of your binary sources that you've specified for binary caching. Um, anyway. That's my conclusion is, you know, when this tool was first announced a while back, I can't remember if it always started out as open source or they made it open source after they'd been making it. But initially I was skeptical because let's just be honest, Microsoft has a track record of producing tools that work great with inside Visual Studio or, or on Windows, but don't work at all or on other platforms or they don't work well outside of Visual Studio. So I was skeptical at first that this package manager would be worth my time. But um, my experience with it is that uh, I was pleasantly surprised that it, it gave me what I wanted. And while it integrated well with Microsoft tools, it wasn't um, uh, inferior or in a, you know, in a dumbed down configuration when it wasn't working with Microsoft tools when it's just integrating with CMake. Um, so I thought it was pretty good. If there are any questions, we can go to that. Um, I know uh, I, you already discussed about CMake and uh, VC package. Uh, can I conclude that uh, you are saying that VC package is much better than CMake because it uh, it is more automatic and it is uh, it can basically it is more seamless in the building uh, a package. Is that correct? I I would say that it is complementary to CMake. Um, what you saw in my CMake scripts for my little examples is I didn't have to change them at all. I was using Find Package from CMake to locate my dependencies so I can <clears throat> set the appropriate include directories and link directories and so on. And their integration with CMake is such that all the dependencies are downloaded and built at CMake configure time. So they're done, it's done once and it's done early so that because it's done early, you have the advantage that in your CMake build, you don't have to adjust your scripts because find package is just going to work. So in other words, if I don't use VC package, I just use CMake, it will still do the job for me, except that it is much more, perhaps more manual, something like that. Sure. Like let's, let's take a look at my little parsing example here. Let's do it this way. Okay, this is my entire CMake script, right? Mm -hmm. I am saying go, I, I am requiring boost. You have to have boost somewhere on your machine. Now in Windows, 
This is pretty painful because what you have to do is look up the documentation for the find module that works for boost and you have to find out what variables you need to set and you have to point them to the appropriate places in your local machine or on some network share where you've pre-built boost. If you're going to link, if you've got compiled libraries from boost, you have to link against or where you've unpacked boost. If you've just using header only libraries and I've done that a bunch of times, it is doable. And the CMake GUI makes it a little bit easier because you can configure the variables and browse through a dialogue rather than having to type in the whole path to the directory, but you still have to configure it manually. There isn't a, isn't yet a uniform way on windows for CMake to locate installed packages, even packages that you've built and compiled yourself even if those packages have CMake uh, support in them. Whereas on, <clears throat> excuse me, on Linux, the find mechanism in CMake uses package config, which sounds like it's related to all these things we're talking about, but it's a separate tool. And it's a tool on Unix that emits the necessary command line arguments to the compiler and the linker to consume a particular package. So it, it spits out the dash I argument for the include directories and the dash L argument for the link directories and so on. So, um, on Linux, they've had this de facto standard of package config that's made things more uniform so that when you are a, a uh, in a modern Linux distribution and you install the development package, then CMake through the find package mechanism will locate it correctly without you having to do any additional manual variable configuration. But on windows, we haven't had it so easy. You've had to configure a lot of these variables either through environment variables that will be picked up as the default value for the CMake variables or the CMake variables themselves. You have to set all that up to the right locations and then you have to, uh, you know, make sure that you built all the libraries and the, you know, if you're, if you need the 64 bit version, you need to remember to build it 64 bit when you go and download it and unpack it and all of that downloading and unpacking and building is manual. And yet the recipes are, you know, not interactive. It's only manual because it hasn't been automated. So what VC package is doing is taking those canned build recipes, automating them and doing it in such a way that, um, instead of specifying individual variables for each individual dependency that specifies where each individual dependency is located. I just specify this one variable. That's the tool chain file. And then my package VC package.json specifies my dependencies by name and VC package works that back to a source distribution, how to build that source distribution, how to build an install image for that dependency and then glues that into the compiler so that find pack or sorry glues that into cmake at configure time so that my find package just works and i don't have to specify any other variables i know that was a really long-winded answer but i, I did i get to what you were asking yes about? okay yeah i got it now okay good <laughs> i i would have felt bad if i still missed the point yeah thank you so some that, you know, like most things in life, it, Linux and Windows, they each have their pluses and their minuses. Certain things are easier in Linux, harder in Windows, and then the reverse is also true. Um, do we have any other questions? You know, Richard, I I am been following along, and uh, just for fun, I went down, downloaded uh, the VC package, downloaded CMake, got my build environment set up. Uh, integrated it with the command prompt, everything. Um, inside the VC package directory, I created a new directory called sample. And then using the, the two file, the text from the two files in uh, the GitHub uh, example code, I, I created my CMake list.txt and my main CPP.txt. Um, and, but when I go to build it, then I get a uh, an error uh, saying, oh, let's see, um, 
could not find a package configuration file provided by unofficial SQLite 3 with any of the following names. And so I'm just curious if so, so uh, just to uh, make sure I understand what you're saying. The find package for SQLite in your CMake list couldn't locate SQLite. Mm hmm Right. So I, I did install it. Um, so I've noticed that um, even though all these mechanisms are there, they don't necessarily work without a little bit of intervention. And I think... Um, so when, when you... Inv Let me back up a second. When you invoke CMake, did you invoke it with the VC package toolchain? Yes. Well, the DC make toolchain file, yeah. So... So That's let me, interesting. Let me, let me copy it into the chat window. Sure. Here. Well, let's do this. Um, let's oh, keep going with this uh, discussion, but I'm going to end the recording. Okay.